We are recorded now. So if you do ask questions, keep in mind that it's going to be recorded, so keep it clean. We have a guest today. Um, I'd like to introduce Ryan Wing from the JCCC Center for Sustainability. Um, and I'm not sure what your official title is. Senior Sustainability Analyst. He's the guy that knows the numbers and has all the facts. And boy, does he have some cool stuff. Um, a senior sustainability analyst here at JCCC, and I'm going to turn it over to him. So please give him your attention. Take notes. There will be. I'm not sure how you feel about questions. Do you like them as you go, or would you rather have them? Yeah, yeah. Feel free to shout them out. Or okay. Raise your hand as, as He's cool go. about that. Yeah. If you want to shout out a question or raise your hand, go right ahead. Is that a real question? What did you say your last name was again? Wing. W I N G. Um, if there's time at the end of class. I'd like you to type up your, uh, a reaction, notes, include a quote. Hopefully the, the, the audio video will, will, will work this time. But um, if there's time, we can put this a reaction to today's presentation in your blog. You do two a week, just write up your notes real quick online. If we have time in class, we can do it during class time. If last, it, it just kept going. People were enjoying it, and they kept asking questions. There wasn't a lot of time to get in class. And I really appreciate you have so much information. Um, I had the feeling that he could have just kept going and going. This is awesome. But uh, there will be question and answer. Um, I'll encourage that. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. Sure. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, like I said, my name is Ryan. I work in the Center for Sustainability. A um, little brief background on me. Um, I graduated high school um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then moved uh, back to my home state of California um, to go to school for audio engineering. Um, worked in music recording studios in the Bay Area and then in Seattle, um, and then got tired of the music business and came back here to go to school and actually went to Johnson County for a couple of semesters and then graduated from KU um, with the goal of working in sustainability, so here I am. Um, so, um, let's see, I'll give you kind of an overview of um, what our office does and, the, and then a couple things that I in particular um, work on with the office and kind of give you a, a little bit of a behind the scenes of what happens at the college and um, how we try to help the college as an office. So, um, first off, um, who, who feels comfortable with what the idea of sustainability is? So would anybody like to take a stab at kind of defining it? Yeah. It's um, managing your resources so that they don't run out. Yeah, so he says managing resources so they don't run out. So um, I assume by resources you mean like natural yeah. resources. So um, resources that come from nature. Um, ultimately, everything comes from nature. So managing resources, so that we'll, we'll have them in the future. Um, anybody else have any other things to add to that? No? Okay, that's fine. Um, that's, um, the, that kind of hits on um, kind of the environmental aspect of sustainability. I think when you hear sustainability talked about in the news, um, or especially in marketing, a lot of people um, are, are just referring to the environmental aspect of it. Um, and I, I like to differentiate between environmentalism and sustainability. Um, I don't consider myself an environmentalist. Um, environmentalists are usually concerned with conservation, um, protecting animal species, you know, that kind of thing. Um, sustainability focuses on um, human and environmental interaction and um, resources that come from nature, but also focuses on social systems and economic systems. Um, so it's a little more broad than environmentalism and, and really focuses a lot more on uh, humanity, actually, than um, the, the environment. Yeah, as they say. Um, so um, what we do as an office, who, who's aware of what's a sustainability thing that we have on campus? 
that you're aware of. Okay. That thing. That that building right there? And what are you aware of about that building? Galileo's pavilion. Is it an energy provider thing? Yeah, it does. I it, saw a windmill outside there. Yeah, it does create some of its own energy. Do you have a class in there by no. any chance? Does anybody have a class in Galileo's pavilion? No? Okay. We only had one from last Maybe time. Maybe it's solar energy. Yeah, it does have um, solar on the roof here. We can just talk about that building now, actually. Um, I apologize. We we just um, kind of got a website upgrade, and um, the photo gallery didn't quite make it over in the upgrade. So um, I don't have all the photos of it to show you, but um, it does have solar on the roof. Um, it has 44 solar panels on the roof, um, which are about 9.6 kilowatts. Um, so for reference, if you're not familiar with how much a kilowatt is, that's about, that's enough energy to power two average Johnson County houses. Um, it also has a wind turbine that you mentioned. Um, you can't see it in this photo. Um, it's a small wind turbine that's only 2.4 kilowatts. Um, that's about a half a house or so. Um, and because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow, um, the, between the two, um, they power about 75% of the building's total energy use is what they're, they're estimated to produce. So um, if it were a sunny, windy day, um, it would probably power the building entirely. Um, so a couple other things that this building um, does. It has passive solar design. So a, lo a lot of green architecture um, is all about the design work that's done up front, um, and then the construction after the design work is, is fairly straightforward. Um, this building was designed and built by KU students. Um, there's a capstone architecture course at KU called Studio 804, um, and so students voluntarily enroll, and over the course of one academic year, they design and then they physically build a building themselves. Teach them about what happens when they put something down on paper as an architect of how that manifests into a real building and, and what's involved in that so that they're, they're kind of more aware and, and able to work with engineers better in the future because um, they know what the ramifications of putting something on paper are. Um, so, so they designed and they built this. Um, they've done I think eight or nine buildings now. They've done uh, they started out with mostly doing houses. Um, all of their stuff is all sustainable green architecture that's been the focus of that program uh, from the start. Um, and the last three or four years, they've done commercial buildings. Um, they did the visitor center in Greensburg, Kansas after the tornado. So they have a, a, a green building that's a visitor center. Um, they built this, this center for design research on KU's campus uh, two years ago, and then last year they built this building for us. Um, it, you can't see in the photo. The building's U-shaped, so it, there's another um, piece to it um, that looks like that on the other side. Um, both of those pieces on the end are classrooms, and then this middle piece here is uh, actually a student lounge that's open 24-7 for all of you to use. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a cool space. Um, so if you ever have some free time on campus and uh, want to hang out, you're, you're welcome to go there and use that space. Um, so the passive solar design that the students designed in the building, these glass, uh, the large glass pieces um, that cover this, the whole south of the building were reclaimed from a project that um, was supposed to be built on the plaza and that project was then canceled. So they had these large sheets of glass that were otherwise uh, potentially just going to be wasted. Uh, so Studio 804 was able to get their hands on them and use them. Um, and so they kind of actually ended up designing the building around those pieces that kind of dictated the height of the building um, and that kind of thing. So. And then there are slats of frosted glass um, in front of the larger pieces of glass. And that frosted glass um, is that each slat
flat is hung at um, a very specific angle um, that allows for when the sun is higher on the horizon during the summer, um, that the angle at which those are hung shades the sun from hitting the glass behind it so it doesn't heat up the building in the summer. Um, but with the angle that they're hung at, uh, when the, the sun is lower on the horizon in the winter, it actually allows the sun to shine through and through the glass and to heat up the building naturally uh, during the winter. So, um, very clever design. Um, there a lot of green buildings um, incorporate that. Um, it has uh, where there's not solar on the roof, um, it has what's called a green roof. So it has sedums, which are a, a really hardy plant that can survive cold, hot, um, all kinds of conditions. Um, planted in trays, little square trays that cover the rest of the roof. Um, and so that prevents the roof from heating up during the summer um, as much as it otherwise would and keeps the building at a more steady temperature um, so that you don't have to heat and cool it as much. Um, the, the roof also reclaims rainwater and melting snow now. Um, that water goes into a cistern that's underneath the building um, and is held. Um, there are, inside this building, there are the whole north wall of the, the building is basically covered in um, a green wall, so it has plants from ceiling to um, floor, basically. Um, and so the, the rainwater that's harvested from um, outside is used to water the plants. Um, and the rainwater actually also goes into the toilets um, because you don't have to put perfectly fresh treated water in a toilet for obvious reasons. Which um, toilets? Hmm? Which toilets? The ones here on campus? The, the toilets inside this building. Oh, this building. Yeah. Um, and it, that may seem like a small thing, but actually, um, the, by far and away, the largest energy user in all of Johnson County is the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to treat water and make it clean <coughs> for us to drink, and there's really no reason to put drinkable, potable water in the toilet. So um, that, that actually is, is a, a very important system in the building. Um, so go over and check it out. It, it's a really cool building. Um, they use all the materials in the building, the furniture, the paint, um, all is zero or low VOC. A VOC is a volatile organic compound. Um, so um, the, what happens is, um, for instance, in furniture, like the, this office chair here, um, in order to meet commercial code and in order for this chair to even be sitting in this building, um, it's filled with fire retardants um, that are, it's literally pounds of chemicals that are pushed into the foam that's in the chair. Um, so that, I, I, I guess the idea, it's a government regulation, so I guess the idea is if the building erupts into flames and you keep sitting in the chair, the chair won't burn for like 15 minutes or something, but then you're stuck in a burning building, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. To me, the regulations don't really make a lot of sense. Um, but, the chemical industry really likes the, those regulations because it allows them to sell a whole bunch of chemicals which get pumped into the foam. So, um, so the, the, the chemicals that are pumped in there are released as volatile organic compounds. They, they go into the air and they're bad for human health. Um, so um, all the paint and all the furniture and all of that is all either low or zero VOC. Um, so the inside of green buildings is supposed to be a lot more healthy than a building otherwise is, um, just for people to be in. So, so it's a cool space. Go check it out if you haven't. Um, and it's open to um, any type of class. We, we have Spanish classes. Um, no, there's an economics class. Um, what was the class from last period? Crime. A criminal justice. Yes. Yeah, criminology. Criminology. Um, so there's all kinds of classes. So you, if you're here um, for future semesters, you very well may have a class in here. Um, so what else are you aware of that we have on campus other than the pavilion? We have lots of trees. We, we do, yeah, we, we have a fair amount of trees. It's 
sustainable shade. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that featured on our website. Except for when everything dies in the winter. <clears throat> yes, Kansas is very bleak. In the winter. <laughs> um, what else? Thank you. Yeah, I somebody would probably notice the multitude of blue bins that are. Um, we just put those out, I think, in Flat State World. Um, so, um, so as of now, we um, do operate the recycling program for the campus. Um, we just got single stream recycling. Um, so, if you have recycling at home, this is probably how it's done. So you can put all of the same all of the same type of materials into one bin. You don't have to sort it. So we can do paper, plastic, cardboard, um, metal cans can all go in the same bin. Yeah. Have you guys looked into the possibilities or uh, benefits of buying 3D printers to recycle goods to turn them into new goods? You know, I just found out like a week or two ago that apparently we've had a 3D printer on campus for like five years. So what? No. Yeah, no. I have no idea. Communication is uh, a problem. I can't yeah. Our last yeah. yeah, communication on campus is a problem. So. Um, apparently we've had one for like five years, and uh, I guess it only prints um, plastic, um, so um, I was happy to hear that we had one. Um, I was especially happy to hear that we've had one for five years. Um, but no, since I just found out that we had one, I've made no attempt to, you know, do something like recycle our own plastic into 3D. I mean, melts it down and, and turns it into like a thin string basically of plastic which then gets fed into the printer and the printer melts the plastic and puts it, it reassembles it back into a thing. Um, they, 3D printing is, is going to change the world. Oh, uh, dramatically. really? Yeah. They, they put it off a human kidney. Yeah, they, they are starting to be able to do biological 3D printing. Yeah. And, and, and print a layer spin onto a lady's hand after a car accident. 3D, 3D printing is a huge deal. Um, and it's it's going to change the entire world. Yeah, yeah, because now you don't have to, um, if people that create products don't have to wait three months to have something prototyped. You can literally print it, and 12 hours later, you have a working prototype of the thing that you just designed in the computer. You can then, like you said, you can share those plans with anybody on the internet. You could, exactly. You could download the plans, you know, for whatever, a and new lunchbox. I don't know if you watch Big Bang Theory, but on the Big Bang Theory, they had a, one of the guys had a 3D printer, and then they were talking about how they could make action figures, and they commissioned action figures of themselves for $1,000. And they said, well, we could just put the money together and get a 3D printer, so they did so. And then they got a 3D scanner. So they just went up to themselves, scanned themselves, and then printed, printed themselves off the printer just by scanning. <laughs> I didn't see that episode, but those... Yeah, you could just go over the car and then print your car. Yeah, there have been experiments to 3D print entire houses to, to build the components <laughs> off of... Why is it called printing? Yeah, I was going to say, because I kind of it, it, So it prints in layers, basically. So, like, it'll put down a very thin layer of plastic where um, the base of the whatever you're printing would be sitting on the table, and then it just builds up from there in 3D. So it, it'll keep putting layers of plastic or whatever material it prints with on top of one another. So you could build... Like they did the Harley Davidson. They built the Harley Davidson. Oh, really? Push button. Yeah, right. so you don't have to build... You don't have to <laughs> well, print like print an metal. entire yeah. item at once. Yes, you can. They, they have the metallic, metallic uh, materials. Like <laughs> yeah. Print off. Oh, I am yeah. so confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen 3D printing, look it up, because it, it's coming it's really fast. Yeah, that yeah. seems like really sci-fi channel-ish. Oh, it's, it's big. It's here, yeah. Um, put that review for sure as well. Yeah, it's, it's, 
crazy. When they put human tissue in it to build a kidney? Yeah, and then essentially they could extract human memory and put it into a new body. You think about it, you can live lifetime after lifetime just going new body to new body. Uh, I mean, once it gets, you know, perfected to yeah. the point where it's, it's actually <laughs> <laughs> <it's laughs> <it's laughs> like, a new blob <laughs> entry. <laughs> I feel I worry about sustainability. I mean, I love my iPad, but those don't recycle, do they? No, no, and that, that's so that's a huge problem in sustainability is looking at the life cycle of stuff. Um, so there's a, a good video. I'm not going to show it to you. I think it's 15 minutes long or so, but it's called the story of stuff. Um, so you may look that up, um, and it's a great. It's mostly animated um, and narrated, but it just kind of talks about how um, it is, it, it's a little biased, I, I, I'm going to put that out there, it's a little, um, it, it, the way that it's worded is a little heavy, I think, um, but it, it talks about how things flow through the economy in a, a linear fashion, we imagine it kind of like our lives, it has a birth and it has a death, but we don't really treat um, stuff. That once we're done using it, we don't really think about what happens to it after that. We throw it away and it goes away, you know, but we don't. So yeah, so uh, those, the, the types of decisions that are made around that, um, so I studied economics at, at KU, was one of my majors, um, and so one of the, the main focuses in, in economics that, that I um, took a particular interest to is um, when any time something is made, um, now with using fossil fuels and that type of thing, Pollution is created when things are made, basically. So, but the problem is, in economics, no one pays for pollution. Um, it has a value of zero in the, the economy right now. Um, so, and part of the problem is, um, especially here in America, we like free markets, right? That, that's something you hear a lot in the news, especially in politics, um, that the free market economy is, is Capitalism is kind of why America is the way it is in here today. Um, and, and that's not a value judgment, it's just sort of the fact. Um, so, um, <coughs> but one of the central tenets of a free market economy is that all costs are paid by producers of goods. Um, and right now, we don't charge anyone for the cost of pollution. So those costs are never paid directly by the people that make stuff or the people that buy stuff. Um, so, for instance, every time you fill up your car with gas, you pay for the gas, you pay for what went into producing that gasoline, but you never pay for the pollution that comes out of your tail, tailpipe. And those, the, the pollution that is created from that um, has very real and very quantifiable effects. So, whether that's asthma in medical um, uh, medical conditions or um, that could be affecting um, the viability of soils with uh, nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide um, that are produced when gasoline is combusted. Um, these are all very real quantifiable things. Um, so um, the, be, because that pollution isn't paid for, that's kind of how we re we've ended up in, in a situation where I would say the economy is unsustainable. Um, so, because we don't, we don't take care of um, the resources that we have. So, um, kind of a tangent there, but um, anything else that you're aware of? So, um, the 
water bottle stations. Every, everybody has seen the re refillable bottles. Cool. Even better. Um, so those bottles. Let's see if I can find it here. Oh my god. Yeah, it shows like a number of how many. So that, that link is broken, but um, it's, oh, there we go. So there's there's the bottle stations if you haven't seen them. Um, those uh, bottles, the, the, the bottle refillers um, came from a group on campus that's called the Student Sustainability Committee. Um, how many of you are aware that you financially support sustainability activities on campus? Anybody? You're not directly paying for me, I can assure you of that. Um, but, um, what, so we have what's called the Sustainability Initiatives Fund on campus. So at $1 of um, every credit hour that you enroll in goes towards sustainability projects. Just $1? Um, $1, yeah. Is that why it goes up every semester? So that adds up to a lot of money, um, $1 per credit hour. Um, so. That money, because it's, it is your money, it's student money, um, it's spent by students. So there's a committee of students called the Student Sustainability Committee, um, and they're in charge of appropriating those dollars. And, and those dollars are meant for um, primarily campus infrastructure and campus upgrade um, items. Yeah, so they, they bought these for the campus um, and paid for them to be installed um, with the idea of Trying to eliminate the idea of disposable, which again, you know, you know, you're not paying those costs, but disposable water bottles um, that can be refilled or, uh, instead. And um, so, this was one of the projects they've done. Um, you can look at that they fund a lot of projects every year, so you can see um, we publish every semester what um, they do. Those meetings are also. Um, open to whoever wants to be involved. So if you'd like to be involved in that committee, just let us know. Um, uh, they do some pretty cool things. So, um, anything else that you're aware of that's going on? No. Okay. Those good. Those are those are kind of the primary things that a lot of people see. Um, all the water, all the hand washing things are like. Oh yeah, yeah. So little things like that. Yeah. The, um, I love that dice. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. 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 For instance, aerators on every faucet um, around campus, so less water comes out, uh, a lower rate of water flow. Um, we retrofitted um, most of the toilets and urinals on campus, um, and those went from, what did they go from, like almost three gallons of flush to like one gallon per flush per toilet, so dramatic um, difference there, um, and so those are estimated to pay for themselves in like five or six years, just in water savings. Yeah. So, like, so you guys, I don't know, built some sort of like a recycling water plant on campus. Can you use like reverse osmosis to like recycle water? I mean, to treat it? Right. Um, I suppose we could. I don't know that it would be efficient for us to build our own water treatment. You know, versus sending it to the county to be centrally treated. Um, but it is an interesting question. And, and like um, Galileo's Pavilion has the water um, recirculating systems, basically, that's called a gray water system. Um, and that's very, very common in, in green buildings. Um, there's a, um, a, a skyscraper in New York um, that's owned by Bank of America. And so they built it um, to be a green skyscraper. And um, what one of the water things that it does 
is when you wash your hands, um, it stores that water in a cistern and then it puts that water into the toilets. Um, so rather than putting clean water in toilets, um, it uses water that is fine to be in a toilet, you know, and then goes out and, and is treated after um, it's been used twice instead of just once. So um, it's, it's not a complicated system, you know, it just takes a little bit of thinking and a little bit of, yeah, a little design ahead of time. Yeah. Okay, so like that complete green building at yeah, Galileo. Mm -hmm. All right, so compared it to the benefit of how much you, less you spend on maintaining that building, how much do you pay for it, and how long does it take to pay itself off? Sure. Um, it's hard to say with this building um, in particular um, for a couple reasons. One, if our goal was to put up two boxes to house classes in and one lounge, you could do that extremely inexpensively, you know, relative to this, but that wasn't the goal. You know, the goal was, um, it, it's kind of intended to be a demonstration project specifically with this, to demonstrate um, to you all, you know, this is solar, you know, and there's a dashboard, a touchscreen dashboard inside the building where you can see how much energy is being created in real time by the solar and by the wind. Um, and um, there is a monitor in, um, a, 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 it's just like a little screen um, back in a corner and, and you can monitor how full the cistern is at any point. Um, and so it, it, there's a lot of information on the walls about how the building works. So it, it, the building itself is meant to be educational. Um, that being said, we got an amazing deal on the building because it was built by the students. Um, so all of their labor was, in effect, free. Um, that building is, it, it's estimated if, it, if we were to have bought it at market value, it's supposed, supposedly worth a little more than $1.5 um, We We bought it for a little over $700. So we got it for about half price. And what, what would you say the square footage of the building? The building is, a, I think, about 2,500 square feet, if I remember right. Um, but the second part, you know, the, to answer your question, though, more generally, versus just this building in particular, um, the... You need the, building bills got to be cheap. Yeah, yeah, very, very inexpensive for this building. And, um, for green buildings in general, if you build them to this type of standard, um, it, overall, it, there's about a 1% to 2% cost premium up front to build the building this way instead of another similar type building. Uh, so it's, the cost premium isn't very high. If it's a large commercial project, even 1% or 2% could come up to tens of thousands of dollars, but that pays for itself very quickly um, in energy, water um, right. savings. And there's a lot of research that have gone into these buildings too because of um, the health benefits and, and kind of the in, internal environment within the building has shown to make um, workers more product, productive inside these buildings. A lot of them have more natural light than an, a, another building might, um, and that's a big factor in it. So. Yeah, yeah, not as much fumes. Um, right. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot of advantages to them, um, and and really a very very low cost premium at this point. Um, the government, it, for instance, mandates that all buildings be built to these type of standards now because they know that it it pays for itself so quickly. That it's really Yeah, uh, that could be one way to incentivize it. I, I don't. I'm not even convinced that you would need a subsidy necessarily you know, at this point for this type of, of project. But but there, a subsidy is uh, something that's used frequently in sustainability to try to try to encourage this, this type of thing. Um, so um, let's see. How many people knew that we compost on campus? So we come.
compost all what, what's called pre-consumer food scraps, so food that never made it to any of you um, is composted. So that's scraps from food preparation and also leftover food, um, for instance, on like the hot and the cold bar that's not eaten at the end of the day, that's dumped into uh, compost also. So um, this, to give you the kind of quick rundown, so um, food's all gathered up in the kitchens. Um, food then goes to this um, composting system here. So this is what's called an in-vessel composter. Um, so the food is loaded in to um, this part of it here, and there's just an auger, which is just like a drill, I guess I'll call it. It, it just spins and it loads the um, food into the bin, um, that big drum. And that drum very slowly rotates, um, so it mixes it, and when the food is put in, we mix it with sawdust. Um, that sawdust is a waste product from a woodworking mill that makes cabinets. Um, they would otherwise just throw it away um, and pay to throw it away, but instead they put it in bags and we take it and get it for free. And it's our carbon source and the food is the nitrogen source, so you balance the carbon and the nitrogen and, and that's how compost happens. Yeah. We only use like specific food, right? Because we have an in-vessel system, we can compost any type of food. We, um, at home, you don't want to compost meats and cheeses. Uh, those will attract raccoons and um, kind of stuff that you don't want. Yeah, because I've seen that people do it if there's a, like, fruits and vegetables. Yeah, or yeah. Stuff. But you can at home. Meats that's and what cheeses. you want to do. Yeah, we can we can compost anything. Why can you do that? How can you do that? Um, we can do that because it it's contained within here. There's not really as much risk of it attracting things okay. like raccoons or but rats. But it does compost. It doesn't, there's no reason you can't compost meats and cheeses. Other right. Is there a bigger Very bacterial long. danger? Um, there is. Yeah, there is that component, um, bacterial danger with meats. Um, but I'll show you here. Um, so part of my job is to track and monitor and measure programs that we um, have on campus. So with the um, bacterial danger, so we measure regularly the temperature of our compost and the moisture levels and all that. Um, and the internal temperature inside the composter itself gets to about 110 degrees. And that's just naturally through um, decomposition and, and microbial action. Um, and um, it would get hotter in there, but um, with the amount of food that we compost, we have to um, offload it pretty frequently, otherwise that whole drum would get full. Um, so it gets to about 110 inside the composter. It stays in the composter for about two weeks and spins, and it's mostly finished when it comes out. Um, for reference, if you just put um, food scraps or lawn waste or whatever into a pile. A pile would take six or seven months to um, become compost. So we're, we then let it sit in piles after it comes out of the composter. But it only needs about another four weeks and it's really um, good to go. So uh, we, we compress the whole thing into about a month and a half, which would otherwise take six or seven months. Um, and a lot of that is because of the amount that we compost. Yeah. So especially due to like new technology, you gotta be more you know, beekeeping as in foods and uh, you know, keep recycling it, keep it printing. What kind of employment opportunities are there out there for sustainable food? Um, well, we have an intern in our office <coughs> actually, and he's basically taken over the, the composting program. Um, he's worked with us for about a year now. Um, He's been awesome. He runs the whole thing. He's expanded the program. Um, he's improved the program from um, when we started it. We started composting about a year and a half ago, and he's run it for about the last year by himself, pretty much. Um, and he's now going to go to KU. Um, after He'll be at KU next semester. He's going to do environmental science, and he wants to open his own composting business after um, he graduates. Um, 
there is a, a large composting facility in Missouri called Missouri Organic, um, and they take a lot of food waste and, and yard waste too, and they compost it and they sell it. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for businesses that are trying to be more sustainable to send it there instead. It, it costs about the same as it would cost them to just throw it away, so they might as well send it to be composted there. Um, but there's really nothing like that on a large scale on the Kansas side, so I think Eric will probably be the person to start that. Let's see. But I mean, sustainability wouldn't just necessarily just pertain to you know, recycling the environment. You know? Oh, yeah. Would it also, I mean, microbiologists would also have something to do with it? Like yeah. Uh, sorry, I, uh, I misunderstood your question, but um, more broadly, I mean, there are, I, I would say that every single person in this room will work in sustainability in the future, no matter what field you go into, right. it will touch every single aspect um, of life, basically. Um, so there are, there are immense opportunities in it. Um, to, to be honest, you know, if you're into money, people are going to make a lot of money off of exactly. sustainability. Exactly. Where, in business in general, wherever there's a problem, there's an opportunity. Um, and with sustainability, there's pretty much an endless list of problems um, at this point. So there's a lot of room for people to come in and create solutions. And there are already people creating really cool solutions. Um, a couple off the top of my head, I mean, beyond the, the obvious of like a solar installer or a wind installer, um, there are even just in this little startup realm, a lot of startups are obviously in um, Silicon Valley, um, in California, where I'm from. Um, and so there's a company called Uber. Has anybody heard of Uber? No. Yeah, one person. Oh, wait, wait. Uber? Uber, U yeah. U-B-E-R? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it through Twitter because they have a feed called Uber Facts. Hmm, cool. And people retweet it all the time. It's like these crazy facts. <laughs> Uber Facts. <laughs> I like crazy facts. I'm not so Uber is a uh, basically a car sharing ride service. Um, so it's made to replace people having to own their own vehicle. So that's the sustainability aspect of it. But what they've done is um, through social media, basically, um, or increased ability to communicate, you can tell Uber that you need a ride and that you need to. You can tell it where you're at that you need to go to X place. And I saw some figures on it the other day, and in, they're mainly in New York City and San Francisco right now, but um, also largely on the coasts. In New York City, from the time, the average time from when someone says, I need a ride, to they are in a car going is five minutes. So we, if you need to go somewhere, you don't have to worry about you know, having to find a taxi or what's the public transportation time, you can just, in, from this point to five minutes later, you can be in a car going somewhere. So it it's replaces the, the need to own a car yourself, basically, um, and have all the costs associated with owning that car. So it's a cool service. Is it like carpool? Um, kind of. I mean, it, it's it, Uber is a little more like a taxi, basically. Okay. But... Um, it, but it it allows people to become taxi drivers, I guess, basically. So you can use your car to make money. Um, and Uber just takes a Uber takes a cut for facilitating the transaction, basically.